Yeah, welcome to numerical methods. So we started a new section and had a first yeah, very short uh, session on the numerical approximation of partial derivatives. Yeah? So using finite differences to approximate the partial derivative of a function. So let's have a small recap of our last session. So the starting point is the Taylor expansion of our function. So this is our function V. So we consider a revalued function in one argument, extending it to more arguments is straightforward. Then we have the Taylor expansion for a small shift. So there's here a small shift H. So for a small shift, I know that the value at the shifted argument is the value at the unshifted argument, V of X, plus yeah, the first derivative times the shift H. And if you like, plus higher derivatives. So second derivatives times H squared half and so on. And in the end, there is a residual term which we can interpret as an error term. If h is small, yeah, this term will be small. Yeah? So given that the corresponding derivative in front yeah, is, is bounded, yeah, it's a smooth function. We look here on some compact interval. So we have a bound there. Yeah, from this, we could derive different approximation formulas, just depending on which shift we use. Yeah plus h, minus h, or both, and combine them. So we arrived, for example, at the, these three different approximations. So if I just use a shift of plus h, I get the forward finite difference approximation here. Yeah? So this is actually the slope here yeah, of this secant, this section. If I use a minus h, I get the backward finite difference approximation, so this guy here. And if I use plus and minus h, so upshift minus downshift, yeah, then divided by 2h, I get the central finite difference approximation, so this guy here, of the derivative. And from the formulas we derived, so this formula here, this approximation with this error term, we also saw the approximation error. So for the forward finite difference, the approximation error is order h. For the backward finite difference, the approximation error here is also order H and for the central finite difference, because we used two equations, two points, yeah, we could cancel the additional term, the second derivative term, and we are left with a third derivative term. So this is our error term here, and the order is h squared. Yeah, so this was a small recap. This was the situation. So we have this uh, little lemma here that gives us the approximation error for the forward and backward and central finite difference. So for the forward and backward finite difference, yeah, it is order h. And for the central finite difference, the approximation error is order h squared. So this lemma suggests that we should choose h small, yeah, as small as possible. And then we had a small numerical experiment where we tried this. Yeah? So actually this was a teaser at the beginning of the last session. 
So the numerical approximation yeah, using this of the partial derivative of the exponential function, well, you know, derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function And then if we approximate this, say, at x equals zero, so the partial derivative in zero, yeah, then I know that this is equal to exponential of zero, this is equal to one. So I know the analytic solution and I can uh, compare it. And let's have a look at the code we did. Okay, so we had the definition of our x. So this is the point where I would like to approximate the partial derivative. And then I have a function print forward finite difference approximation of exponential with the, at this x with a given shift. Yeah? So this shift here is our h. Yeah? So if you would like to have a little documentation here, so this is the x and this is the h. Yeah, here is the code. Yeah, so we calculate the upshift value. Yeah? So this is my say v of x plus h. We calculate the downshift value. This is the v of x. Yeah? Then we calculate the finite difference. So this is v of x plus h minus v of x divided by h. And then we calculate the error yeah, by comparing this finite difference approximation with the true solution. This is the exponential of x. And I just print this. And I made a few tests with different shifts. Yeah? So quite large shift, 10 to the minus 2, and then 3, and so on. So maybe I run this program again. Okay, so you see for a shift 10 to the minus two, you know, I have you know, quite a large error. Error is five times 10 to the minus three. For a shift 10 to the minus three, I have an error of five times 10 to the minus four. So you see, really, this suggests to choose the shift very small, but then we, choose, we have chosen the shift 10 to the minus 16, yeah, so very small. And we suddenly saw that the error is minus one. So the finite difference approximation jumps to zero, but it should be around one. Uh, so actually we see that the very small shift does not work. So let's try 10 to the minus 15. Yeah? The error is still very large, yeah? much larger than all of these errors here. A 10 to the minus 12, okay, the error gets into the region where the 10 to the minus 4 is. So we have this little warning here. Our lemma suggests that we should choose h very small uh, to achieve a low approximation error. However, this is not true. Yeah? The numerical experiment illustrates that there is some issue. And maybe let me test another point. Yeah? And then I would like to, uh, un like to understand what is going on here. Yeah? And we will get a very deep understanding for what is going on here. So maybe I print a new line and I test now uh, say a special shift that is of the size two to the power of minus 52. Okay, that's a strange shift. So let's try this guy. So this is in decimal notation, you have a space 10 powers. This is 2.2 times 10 to the minus 16. Yeah, a strange number. It's a very small shift. It's a bit larger than the one that failed completely. And you see that the error is zero. So there is some shift, yeah, some very, very small shift where the error is totally zero. And 
we will get a deep understanding and also understand why this number has this special property, actually also two times two to the power of minus 52, uh, which is 4.4, .4, has this property. So to understand this, it's often helpful to visualize things. So let's add to our experiment a plot. So let's plot very long name for the function. Uh, let's plot the uh, error is a function of the shift. So I would like to see how does the error change if I change the shift. So let's create this function. Uh, I would like to have a few arguments. So you see that here I always stepped in powers of 10. So 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 12. So maybe I call this the scale. Yeah. So here I'm at scale minus 16, minus 15. And maybe it's nice to analyze how the error depends on this scale because small changes to the shift, like going from 0, 0, 1 to 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 5, is maybe not so relevant. But changing the scale appears to be the relevant thing. So let's add an argument. Of course, I have the argument at which point I would like to observe this. And then I would like to have a scale min and a scale max. So please plot the error as a function of the shift ranging from that scale to that scale. So maybe I add here a few arguments. Uh, what is a good range I would like to see? Yeah, so we see that here at 10 to the minus 16. Yeah, so the error was suddenly collapsing. Yeah, or the, the approximation was suddenly collapsing. Error was minus one. So maybe I should choose minus 16.5 as a relevant scale. And then maybe let's go up a little bit. Let's go to minus 14. That's maybe a nice plot. No? So maybe I can see what's going on there. So let's implement now the function that creates this plot. Yeah, I would like to have a function. Sorry. Um, so I would like to have a function that maps the given scale to the approximation error. Let's just define this function as a double unary operator. This is the double unary operator. This is my finite difference approximation error. And this approximation error maps the scale of the shift to, yeah, say, the error. So first calculate the shift from the scale parameter. So this is the shift is 10 to the power of scale. Okay, yeah, so you see... 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 14. We will use now different scales. So this is the shift. And then calculate again my finite difference approximation. Yeah? So maybe we do it all again. So the upshift value is the exponential at x plus shift. The downshift value, or the unshifted value, sorry, is the exponential at x. The finite difference approximation is value upshift minus value divided by the shift. The analytic derivative is the exponential at x, and the error is the difference. Okay, I could also have just copied the code, huh? but now, it's not so much. So, and return that error. So, that's now the definition of my function. Yeah. 
a function that plots the error in terms of the scale of the shift size. Yeah, then I have a nice helper that allows me to plot this function. So let's call this helper. So I have a new 2D plot. And this 2D plot has now an argument for this x-axis where the x-axis should start and end. So this is my scale min and my scale max. So plot this function from there to there. Uh, use uh, 1,000 points. You know, and which function should we plot? Yeah, we should plot our error function, this guy. So this is the plot that we uh, generate. And uh, then I can show the plot. So maybe I run this little program. Hopefully everything is correct. Okay, this is how the function looks like. Okay, strange shape. Maybe I make the plot a bit nicer and also add a title and description to the axis. So I prepared this, yeah? so a bit cheating. So I did not do uh, anything different here except that in addition, I also draw the horizontal line x equals zero. So where we have no error and I add a title and some uh, some description at the x-axis and the y-axis. So maybe I run it now again. Okay, so now my plot has um, a title and description on the x-axis. So we see here the scale. The scale is the logarithm base 10 of the shift size. And okay, this is our error. And yeah, the green line is of course having no error. And you see that we oscillate around the error zero. So some points have zero error and maybe this is a, uh, my first claim. Yeah. So this point here has error zero. So this point here corresponds to h being equal to 2 to the minus 52. Yeah? So this is 1 divided by 2 to the power of 52. So the coordinate that we see there is the base 10 logarithm of 2 to the minus 52. Maybe I check this in the calculator. So 2 to the power of minus 52. Okay, so this is our 2.2 to the power of minus 16. And take the base 10 logarithm as a minus 15.65. Yeah, so this could be, you know, this is maybe correct. So this here is a minus 15.65. And this was the point where we observed that we had zero approximation error. So this is really the picture that now plots the error. And you see also the effect that if you get too small with your shift, so if your shift is yeah, around 10 to the minus 16 or below, then you have an error of minus one. So the finite difference approximation suddenly becomes zero. Yeah, what is going on here? So what are we calculating is the finite difference approximation of the derivative. So this is exponential of x plus h, but x is zero, so exponential of h minus exponential of x, x is zero, so minus one, divided by h, and then, this is my finite difference approximation, I subtract the true solution, so this is minus one. Yeah? So exponential of zero is minus one. And it appears as if we have some kind of rounding error in the calculation of the exponential function. So um, what's going on 
is that exponential of h is of course for a small number maybe rounded to a floating point representation okay so there's some rounding so if h makes a small change you will get the same number here yeah and then if h has changed a little bit more you are rounded to the next number so there are some kinds of jumps. Yeah. So these jumps here correspond to the point where exponential of h, the result, is rounded to the next floating point number. And in between, this number here stays at this rounded number. So you see that the only change If error is a function of h, the only change that you observe is that you divide by a different h. So within the interval, the small interval for changes to h, where exponential of h is still rounded to the same result, the only thing that changes is that you divide the same number, float of exponential of h minus 1, by a different h. So this here is like 1 divided by h. Yeah? So it is a, actually, it is a constant divided by h minus 1. So these are the changes in h, and then we jump again to the next number. And can I identify when this happens? So first, we consider only small h, and we have a forward finite difference approximation, so h should be larger or equal zero. So for h larger or equal zero, I know that the exponential function is larger or equal one. And if h is small, well, I can ensure that exponential of h is maybe less than two. So if the result exponential of h is in the interval from one to two, then I know the floating point representation of the result. So exponential h occurring here in my finite difference is in the interval from one to two. And this guy is now rounded to a normalized floating point number so in the interval from one to two, I know that is normalized floating point number, and I also know the representation. Yeah. So this normalized floating point number is one plus c divided by two to the power of p. So this we know from our chapter on computer arithmetic, how the computer represents uh, the numbers, the floating point numbers, and this is the representation. So for double precision numbers, the numbers I've used here, the P is 52. So now you know, okay, why there is this strange 52 in my example. Okay, so the result is rounded to this number. But you, you also know that exponential h for small h is approximately 1 plus h. So 1 plus h is approximately the true result. So if 1 plus h is approximately the true result and the computer result is rounded to 1 plus c divided by 2 to the power of p, then I know that the h is approximately c divided by 2 to the power of p plus minus the rounding error. And the rounding error is, say, 1 half divided by 2 to the power of p. So this here is our rounding error of the result. However, h is a small number, and the computer can represent many different values, h. Yeah? For example, in such an interval, 1 divided by 2 to the power of p, or 2 divided by 2 to the power of p, yeah? There are many different values. So he has much more values for the argument to represent as he has values for the result. 
So the computer can represent many different values h, but for all these values h, exponential of h is rounded to one of these few values. Yeah, So 1 plus c divided by 2 to the power of p, or the next one, 1 plus c plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of p. So you see, this is the region where we discretize the argument h. There are many different values. And this is the region where we discretize the result of the function. And there are only few values. Yeah, for example, note if h is 1 divided by 2 to the power of p, this is a normalized floating point number that is 1 plus c divided by 2 to the power of p with c equals 0, multiplied with 2 to the power of e, with e being minus p. So the difference here is just the e. Yeah, so this here is e is minus p, and this here is actually e is minus p plus 1. So this is just a difference in scale. And how many numbers are in this interval? There are 2 to the power of 52 different numbers in this interval. Yeah? Closed, left, open, right. There are many, many numbers. So if I just consider now the case c equals 1, so I just consider the case c equals 1. So I look at, say, the number 1 divided by 2 to the power of p and what is happening around there. Then I have the following result. If the shift size h is 1 divided by 2 to the power of p, so my shift size h is now 1 divided by 2 to the power of p, then the result, 1 plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of p, has an exact representation. So this goes there. So I know that actually the result is exact and there will be no approximation error. If h has the value 2 to the power of, uh, 2 divided by 2 to the power of p, then the result is 1 plus 2 divided by 2 to the power of p. And this has also an exact representation with c equals 2. However, all the points that are here in the interval, say from 0.5 to 1.5, 0.5 divided by 2 to the power of p to 1.5 divided by 2 to the power of p, all these points will be rounded to the same value. Huh? Namely, the result exponential of all these points is 1 plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of p, because he has only this number. So you see, I have small lines here. Yeah? So everything that is in between this interval is, so this is the image of this interval, is then rounded to this point. If my input shift size is smaller, so say from 0 to 0 0.5 divided by 2 to the power of p, I will be rounded to 1. If my input size is larger, say from 1.5 to 2, uh, 1.5 divided by 2 to the power of p to, to 2 divided by 2 to the power of p, well, then I will be rounded to 1 plus 2 divided by 2 to the power of p. So this guy is rounded to, um, say, a fixed value, yeah, depending on which region we are. So this here is then rounded to a fixed value, depending on which region to we are. And in between, in this region, I just observe a 1 divided by h. So this means that we will observe this 
run divided by h behavior here, yeah, and somewhere in between, yeah, is the oh solution, yeah, is the is the uh, or some somewhere in between, there is the approximation error is the, is is zero. So then, exponential of h is rounded to the next higher value. So that means I jump up, and I have again some one divided by h behavior. So I can also explicitly write down the function that you see there. So if we use our approximation exponential of h is one plus h approximately, yeah, then I'm actually rounded to, okay, so this on top here is an integer, right? and it is the closest integer to h times two to the power of p because I would like to represent h as an integer divided by 2 to the power of p. So bring the 2 to the power of p to the other side. So h times 2 to the power of p is rounded to the nearest integer. This is my c. And then I divide by 2 to the power of p and add the 1. The one. So this is the floating point representation of exponential of h. So then you divide by h again in your finite difference and you subtract uh, the one. And this is the error that we observe. Yeah, So this here is our error function. And maybe we can calculate a few points. So I already calculated the queen dot in my example. So if I use as a shift one divided by two to the power of p, so this is my shift is two times 10 to the minus 16. With respect to my scale parameter, this is the log 10 of this h, this is the minus 15.65. Then this corresponds here to this green point. So the blue point the blue point in my example here is should correspond to a shift size 2 divided by 2 to the power of p. This is the next point where we are exact. So this is then that point. Okay, so this guy corresponds to the shift size being 2 divided by 2 to the power of 52. So maybe I just calculate that guy. Yeah? So 2 to the power of five, minus 52 is this times 2 is that. So that's the next point and take the log 10. So this is minus 15.35. Yeah? So this is here, a minus 15.35. Huh? Okay, so we have a very good understanding for uh, this picture, so how this picture behaves. Yeah? So this here, this region, is actually the region where exponential of h, yeah, for the very small h, is rounded to 1. So exponential of h minus 1 is 0. So the whole finite difference approximation is zero. So at the values c equals one half, c equals 1.5, the error jumps due to the rounding to the next value. And at c equals 1.0, the approximation error is zero. So maybe I can also verify this jump in my little program. So let's go to our other program. I comment out the plot, yeah, so I don't want to see the plot again. And maybe I can also look at the jump. So let's plot the values or print the values for a little bit below one half divided by two to the power of 
52 and say one half because my claim was this is the region where I jump. Yeah? Okay, you still see both these guys are rounded to zero in the finite difference. So let's be a little bit larger here. Okay, and then it jumps. Yeah, So you see truly that the jump is around one half divided by two to the power of P. And I jump up to the value 0 0.96. So you see that the size of the jump yeah, also is consistent with what we calculate. So this here is a 0 0.96. So actually, I should be maybe a bit smaller. Let's take a smaller value, 0 0.99. So the next jump occurs here. Let's also check this guy. So this is then from 1.499, 1 1.501. So let's uh, look at this guy. Yeah. So we jump from minus 0 0.3 to plus 0 0.3. Okay, so this looks also correct. Yeah, so I jump here from minus 0 0.3 to a plus 0 0.3. Okay, so the jumps get smaller and smaller yeah, because the H gets larger and larger. So well, on, on the top, you see, this is the jump that occurs, but you divide by larger and larger shift sizes. So you now see that from this perspective, we should use a large H. Right? So H should be as large as possible to reduce the rounding error induced jump. So the jump in our finite difference approximation, yeah, and, and then in the finite difference approximation error, this gets smaller as H, H gets larger. So choose H large. So now I have two things yeah, that push in different direction. Taylor expansion tells me choose H small. Computational arithmetics, rounding errors, tell me choose H large. So how should I choose H? So let's derive an error estimate for the first order finite difference approximation including our knowledge about computer arithmetic. So not only the error estimate from the Taylor expansion, but also including now what we know from the exercise here on the rounding error. So motivation, our lemma, yeah, so this is the guy from the Taylor expansion that suggests to choose H as small as possible. However, computer arithmetic suggest that we should choose H large yeah, because we have the effect that if H is too small, the result you know, of V of X plus H is maybe the same, rounded to the same number than V of X. So V of X plus H floating point number minus V of X floating point number is actually equal to zero. Huh? So my final difference approximation is always zero if H is too small. Assuming that the function V is continuous, yeah? so small changes in H are small changes in V. So I start with my analytic exact expression with my partial derivative of V. So this is the guy that I would like to approximate. The first step I do is the Taylor expansion approximation error. So my forward finite difference. So the first step is I use the 
forward finite difference approximation, v of x plus h minus v of x divided by h. And I know that this guy has an approximation error that is c2 times h divided by 2, where the constant c2 is related to the second derivative. So I have now a constant c2 here. This is the second derivative of the function with respect to x. So this is what we obtain from the Taylor expansion. So my first step, my first error estimate for the finite difference approximation. The next step is that these functions here are replaced by the computer implementation. So next step is that I replace the V for the upshift value V of X plus H, but also the V of X. I replace them by a computer implementation. So there's a rounding error, a rounding of the result. Huh? So as we have seen, exponential of H is rounded to some result. So what I have to compare now is the finite difference calculated with the computer implementation. So I call the computer implementation now V tilde. So V tilde of X plus H minus V tilde of X divided by H. This is the thing that we do in the computer. And this can be different from the true finite difference approximation. So assume that you have some error alpha, no, some rounding error alpha here. So this is the rounding error that we had, for example, in our exponential of h. No? Then you have that the rounding error in your finite difference approximation is alpha divided by h. So this is our jump yeah, multiplied with the one divided by h. Yeah? So the decay, and then we have maybe another jump, yeah, depending on where we are. And I have it two times, yeah, because I have it for the upshift value and the downshift value. So what is the best thing that you can expect for the alpha? So you know that rounding errors, yeah, so we have a bound on the relative error. So for normalized floating point numbers, we know that the difference of the floating point representation of the number z and the number z, this is bounded by epsilon times z. Yeah? So epsilon here is the machine, machine precision. So the best thing I can hope here is that the error alpha that I observed there is something like the machine precision. Yeah, but machine precision is relative. Yeah? So here relative to the set. Something like epsilon times v, yeah? the magnitude of the function. So our function exponential of x around zero had magnitude one. And that was the reason why I saw just the machine precision. I just saw a rounding error of one divided by two to the power of p. Actually, one half divided by two to the power of p because I go left or right. But if your function is, say, some other function, like 1,000 times the exponential function, of course, the rounding error is then multiplied with 1,000. So for my alpha, the best thing I can hope is alpha is equal to epsilon times c0, and c0 is a bound on the function. So this is the function magnitude. No? For our exponential function, the c0 was 1, so we just saw the epsilon. It could be that alpha is larger. For example, if you use a Monte Carlo simulation, there could be additional errors that are not related to rounding. Yeah, so this here is a bit general. Yeah. 
So if you have some other source of error that could also be inside, but if you just consider now floating point rounding errors, the alpha error is just epsilon times the magnitude of the function. Okay, so I have this result. And then there is a last step. The last step is that I now round the calculation of the finite difference approximation. So subtract the two computer implementation and divide by H. So this result is again rounded to a floating point number. This last step I did not uh, observe in my you know, in my little example. So in my little example with the exponential function, the error was only due to the exponential function rounding the result. But to be precise, there's also here this last step. So the last step is that I now round the finite difference approximation of the computer implementations to the floating point number representing the result. Okay, how can I estimate this? Well, this is also just epsilon times the magnitude of the values, yeah, but the magnitude of the values is the magnitude of the function V divided by H. Yeah? So you can also estimate this guy by epsilon times C0. Yeah? C0, again, just being a bound, bounding the value of your function divided by H. And a two times, yeah, because actually I have the upshift value and the downshift value. So you see that here, I have an epsilon times C0 divided by H. And for our rounding error in the function evaluation, yeah, we also have the same expression. So if I use the best possible case, I have a two times epsilon times C0 divided by H. The same value as I have here. So if I now add the two steps, I see that the error from the finite difference approximation of the two function, the two finite difference approximation, to the floating point result of the finite difference approximation using the implementation, this error is A two times alpha, uh, alpha coming from the rounding error of the function implementation, and then plus another epsilon C0 divided by H. But note, if you consider the best possible case for the alpha, that is, uh, that is larger epsilon C0, okay, the best possible case, alpha equals epsilon C0, The best possible case is a four times epsilon C0 divided by H. So the best possible case is machine precision multiplied with the magnitude of the function divided by H, the H used in the finite difference approximation. And you see that this error becomes large if H becomes small, while this error becomes large if H becomes large. So I can combine now the steps, the two steps I have on the computer implementation error and the step with the Taylor expansion. And we get in total. So we starting with the idea to approximate the partial derivative of the function. And we end up with the floating point representation of the finite difference approximation using the floating point implementation of the function. And we can estimate this error by yeah, an error coming from the function implementation, errors coming from the rounding of the results, plus the error coming from the Taylor expansion. So this is now my combined error estimate 
for approximating the partial derivative with a computer. So now I view this guy here on the right-hand side. I view this as a function of h. So this is my error bound. And I would like to make my error bound as small as possible. So let's try to just minimize this guy as a function of h. So what is a good value such that I get a small bound here? So differentiate this function. So you have a one divided by h here for the guy that's coming from the rounding errors. So this gives me a minus one divided by h squared. And I just have an h here, which is differentiated to a one. So the minimum is attained at minus two times alpha plus epsilon c0 divided by h squared plus one half times c2. So move the one half times c2 to the other side. Yeah. Divide by minus two. Take the inverse, multiply with alpha plus epsilon c0. Since I have an h squared on the other side, take the square root. So my optimal shift is you know, the, there was a four inside, yeah, because of the two and the one half. Yeah, so I can pull that out. Two times square root of alpha plus epsilon c zero, and for the best case. The best case is that the rounding error of my function is just epsilon c0, you know, epsilon times the magnitude of the function. For the best case, this is two times square root of two epsilon c0 divided by c2. Okay, c0 is the magnitude of the function and c2 is a bound to the second derivative of the function. Yeah? So recall that. C0 was a bound for the magnitude of the function, so that's why I call it zero. C2 was a bound to the second derivative of the function, that's why, that's why I call it two. So for the best case, where you plug in alpha is epsilon C0, you have an optimal shift size that is square root of eight, times c0 divided by c2 times epsilon. For our exponential function, where x is 0, and for small h, I have that exponential of h is approximately 1. Yeah, so c0, a bound to the function, is approximately 1. And exponential of x, take the second derivative of this. So we see that the bound c2 is actually the same as the bound c0. So for my exponential function, actually, I have the special property that the two bounds are roughly the same. Actually, they are the same. So you see that this ratio here cancels. And the optimal shift size is square root of 8 times the machine precision. Forget maybe about the 8. Yeah. So I have a square root of the machine precision. The machine precision is 10 to the minus 16. So I have a square root of 10 to the minus 16. Square root of 10 to the minus 16 is 10 to the minus 8. So the optimal shift in our example is roughly a 10 to the minus 8. Let's try this out. Okay, so maybe we choose a few other shifts here. 
or maybe better, I plot now this error in a different region. So maybe I also plot the region, say, from minus 20 to minus 1, so the whole region. And then maybe I also plot from, yeah, 10 to the minus 8 as maybe the approximate, uh, the optimal shift. Maybe let's plot from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 6, yeah, two up, two down. Let's create these plots now. Okay. So on top, you have the picture that we started with. If I go on the large scale from 10 to the minus 20 yeah, to 10 to the minus 1, you see here you have this large noise coming from rounding errors and the jumps, yeah, first jumps between minus 1 and 1, second jump between 1 divided by 3, minus 1 divided by 3, 1 by 3, and so on. Yeah. And then you see that here in this region, the Taylor expansion error is picking up. But we do not see exactly where is the good, good region. If we zoom in a little bit, you see indeed that 10 to the minus 8 is maybe really the optimal choice. Yeah. There are large oscillations coming from the rounding error if you go below 10 to the minus 8. And the Taylor expansion error is picking up if you go above 10 to the minus 8. Very nice picture, very nice verification of our little calculation on what's the optimal shift size. So I also have a collection of these plots here in the script. It's at the end of our section. And you see here that the optimal shift is around a 10 to the minus 8 for our one-sided yeah, or for our forward finite difference. Okay, so what happens if I consider central finite differences? Yeah? The central finite differences, they had a better approximation error in the Taylor expansion. So in my calculation, the stuff on with the computer arithmetic stays the same, but in my approximation error with the finite difference, I now have a third derivative times h squared divided by 6. So we call this guy. Yeah, so it was here. Yeah. Partial derivative is equal to the finite difference centered upshift minus downshift divided by two times the shift size minus a third derivative times h squared divided by six. So I now have a bound on the third derivative. Let's call this bound C3. Yeah, it's a bound on the third derivative of the function in some interval from which I choose my candidates for the shift sizes. All the other estimates stay the same. So the step from the finite difference approximation to the floating point result of the computer implementation of the function V used in the finite difference approximation, this has the same estimate. Yeah, There is the one divided by two coming from the 2H. So that's maybe a small change here. So this guy here, of course, results in the factor 1 divided by h moving to a 1 divided by 2h. But apart from that, the error bound is the same. It's 2 times alpha plus epsilon c0. And for the best possible case, actually, it's a 4 times epsilon c0. So combine the two estimates. Yeah? So the distance from my floating point approximation to the partial derivative we would like to approximate. Yeah? This is the part from computer arithmetics 
plus now a new part coming from my Taylor expansion, one divided by six C3 times H squared. So the best bound yeah, is then obtained if I minimize this function. So same step again here. I would like to minimize this guy. So differentiate. So you will get a minus one divided by h squared here. And here you will get a two times h. Yeah. So I have a one divided by three c3 times h. So to find the minimum, set this to zero. So I have a minus alpha plus epsilon c0 divided by h squared plus a one divided by three c3 times h. This should be equal to zero. So multiply with uh, h squared. That yeah, gives you an h to the power of three. Divide by C3 divided by 3. Yeah, gives, gives you a multiply with 3 times C3. Take the third root of it. So my optimal value for the central finite difference is now the third root of 3 times alpha plus epsilon C0. Choosing the alpha as the best possible approximation error for the function implementation. I have a six times C0 divided by C3 times epsilon machine position to the power of one divided by three. So again, for my example with the exponential function, I had that C0, the magnitude of the function, is approximately the same as the magnitude of any derivative of the function because the derivative is always the uh, exponential again. So I have also here that C0 is approximately C3. Yeah? The magnitude of the function is approximately the same as the magnitude of the third derivative. Um, so in that case, you see that you just have something like the third root, so forget about the six, the third root of the machine precision. So the third root of a 10 to the minus 16, okay, if it would be a 10 to the minus 15, would be a 10 to the minus five. So the suggestion for this case is to choose a 10 to the minus five, yeah, for the case where C0 is approximately equal to C3, a 10 to the minus five in the central finite difference. Maybe I can also check this. So let's do a small um, yeah, modification to our program. So I create another plot. So I just copy this here. And now I plot the central finite difference. Plot central finite difference approximation. So maybe I change here the title, the central finite difference approximation. So I'd plot the error, but now I calculate the error with upshift and downshift. So downshift value is x minus shift. No? And my finite difference is upshift value minus downshift value divided by two times the shift size. So now I have a function that plots the approximation error of the central finite difference in the same way. So maybe I comment these guys here out so I don't want to generate the other plots again. And now let's create the plot central finite difference. Well, what do we choose? Yeah, my suggestion is that, okay, sorry. So maybe I first plot the same results as here on top. Say this small region and this large region to have a nice over, overview. And then my result shows that the optimal shift should be around 10 to the minus five. So maybe plot something, say a 10 to the minus seven to a 10 to the minus three or four. Huh? So the region. 
Let's keep fingers crossed and check if this works. So here you see the picture that we started our session with. You see now it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, you get a compli more complicated structure of the jumps. Okay, why is this? Yeah, you have exponential of x plus h minus exponential of x minus h. And now these two functions have rounding errors and they round at different locations. They jump at different points. Yeah? So this guy jumps, that guy jumps. Yeah? They don't jump at different points and you sometimes accumulate the jumps. So it's getting a little bit more complicated, but you also see that the jump size yeah, is, well, in the initial point, we had a jump size of one. Get, now we just have a jump size of one half because we divide by the two H. Yeah? It's, it's half the jump size. Um, but then the other guy also jumps, uh, but a little bit later. So you see that the central finite difference also does something good to our problem with the rounding errors. The jumps are smaller, but yeah, the effect from the Taylor expansion is actually the guy that is much better, so we can use even a larger shift here. So here you see you have oscillations here. I do not see the Taylor expansion expansion error picking up, yeah, so very hard to see. Unclear where is the good shift size. So if we zoom in to the region from 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 4, you indeed see that, okay, maybe here around 10 to the minus 5.5 yeah, or 10 to the minus 5, there is the uh, good optimal shift size. So in the script, you have the picture for the centered finite difference also here. yeah, And you see that maybe the good shift size is really here in the region for the 10 to the minus 5. Yeah? So don't know where it is exactly. Yeah, that depends a little bit on C0, C3. Yeah? So actually, you could calculate the exact value from our formula. So this is just a lemma summarizing our result yeah, on the error estimate, the combined error estimate for the numerical calculation of the first derivative using one-sided finite difference and centered finite difference where all these constant C0 bound to the function value, C2 bound to the second derivative, C3 bound to the third derivative, play a role, yeah? alpha, the rounding error of the function. Small summary interpretation, yeah, which I just said. And this is maybe a nice little observation here. For the one-sided finite difference, we had an expression that was C0 divided by C2 times epsilon. Uh, this was our optimal shift size. Forget about the constant. And for the centered finite difference, it was square root of C0 divided by C3 times epsilon. And it was the third root, not square root, the third root. When I look at such formulas, sometimes I try to include physical units to just check the formula. This is also a very good technique in mathematical finance. Assume your function is, say, a length, meter, and assume the argument is a time, seconds. Then the bound to the C0 is a bound to the length. Uh, it's something meter. The first derivative is meter per second. It's a velocity. The second derivative is meter per second squared. Yeah? dv by dx squared. Uh, meter per second squared is an acceleration. So C0 is a bound to the 
to, to the length, it has a unit meter. C2 is a bound to the acceleration. It has the unit meter per second squared. So C0 divided by C2 is meter divided by meter per second squared. It has the unit second squared, second squared. So epsilon is a relative error, it's unitless. So the unit of the stuff here below, this guy has the unit, the unit of x squared. Taking the square root, it has the unit of x. So taking the square root, it has the unit of x. In our my example, it has the unit of seconds. And h is a shift to x. So with respect to units, this is exactly the right calculation you do. You translate changes in the function to a change in the argument. And you see that this also holds for the third root. Yeah? C3 has the unit uh, V divided by X to the power of three. C0 has the unit V, the unit of V. So this stuff here below has the same unit as x to the power of three, taking the third root, yeah, it has the unit of x, it is a shift of x. Yeah? So this is a nice thing that you can explore a little bit the units and get a nice interpretation that what we calculate is really the shift, yeah, the right shift derived from how the function translates arguments, changes to function value changes. Okay, so that was my uh, numerical experiment and deriving the um, yeah, optimal shift size. Of course, you find this experiment here in our repository of the lecture. So it is here in this package, finite difference. It's called finite difference experiment, including all the plots, the plots you have here in the script. This guy, this guy. Yeah. And let me just conclude with the remark that, of course, we can also use our Taylor expansion to approximate the second order derivative. So if I go back to my Taylor expansion, so that was here, you just build equations now with different points, x plus h, x minus h, and then you try to cancel the first derivative and just keep the residual term and you get an approximation for the second derivative. So since this, this is very analog, yeah, I do not go through all the details, but here is the example yeah, for the well-known approximation of the second derivative of V. Yeah? So this is the upshift value minus two times the unshifted value plus the downshift value divided by h squared, and you get an approximation error, which is related to the fourth derivative times, yeah, actually it is times h to the power of four divided by the h squared, so times an h to the power of two. Huh? So I have order h to the power of two approximation error. If I take this here, is my approximation. Exercise, you can derive, of course, now, what is the optimal shift size? If you use this formula, this approximation formula, right, this finite difference approximation with some computer implementation that has rounding errors, no, where your Taylor expansion gives you that you have this error. Actually, the calculation is not so difficult. Yeah, You have three times the function involved. So there will be some factor of three in your computer rounding errors. Yeah? You will get three different jumps. There will be a factor of three, but the jumps are divided by h squared. Yeah? So that's also a small change. And then you just find the optimal shift size. So this exercise is not so difficult. Maybe you can try it out and you can maybe also try to modify here this code to also check if your calculation is correct. If you see that 
this is maybe the region where you have an optimal optimal shift. And that was it for today. Yeah, that was a very nice session on approximating partial derivative with finite differences. And maybe you now understand why I really like starting this lecture with the session on computer arithmetic. Yeah. Uh, Recall we had optimal shift size of 10 to the minus eight or 10 to the minus five and 10 to the minus five for a centered finite difference. 10 to the minus five doesn't look like a small number. Huh? So people tend to use two small shift sizes sometimes. Huh? They use a 10 to the minus 10 because they believe it is a good choice. That was it for today. Thanks.